that's not your name You will always be much more to me Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer, in San Diego, every Sunday from 4 to 5 p.m. And you can stream the show at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org. And we've got a fantastic show this evening. I've got an awesome guest and uh, really looking forward to having this discussion. I think you're going to really learn a ton and be very encouraged. I want to start off by updating what's happened with the uh, county clerk, in Kentucky, uh, Kim Davis. If you were paying attention to the news at all, there was a whole bunch of fiasco that happened there. And I want to give an update because that's a, a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight is what happened there. And as as Christians, as believers, and uh, as conservatives, what what does that mean? Uh, so after Ober, o, Obergefell, uh, June 26, 2015, is when that decision was made by the Supreme Court. The federal Supreme Court decided to legalize same-sex marriage in all the states. So uh, that was June 26, 2015. That's a that's a day of infamy there. Uh, very important date that we're going to be hearing a lot of, uh, you know, throughout the rest of U.S. history. So anyway, Kim Davis wasn't, uh, she, she said, I'm not going to give out uh, marriage licenses from my office and neither are any of my uh, assistant clerks or, or, or whatever. But she's not the only one that objected to same-sex marriage. She's the only one, at least that I know of, who refused to perform her job, but also refused to quit her job. So in, te- in Texas, Joyce Lewis, she stepped down. So she said, I'm not going to give out marriage licenses, but she also said, I'm going to step down from no- doing my job. Live Oak County clerk Karen Irving did the same thing. In uh, Cleburne County, Arkansas, their clerk also left. Same with Granada County in Miss- Mississippi, and the clerk's office in Decatur County in Tennessee, lost its entire staff. So again, the the significance of Kim Davis is that she said, I'm not going to do this, but she also said, I'm not going to step down. And I think this is something that we need to pay attention to. uh, And and it's very important. So shortly after the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage in June, she told her employees in her office to stop issuing marriage licenses and that was for gay or straight couples. She said that signing her name to same-sex marriage licenses would be a violation of her religious beliefs. And since she's the Rowan County clerk, this would include any license from the office that carried her name. Now, in August, U.S. District Judge David Bunning ordered Davis to start issuing marriage licenses again. Davis said, nope, not going to happen. So Bunning held her in contempt of court, and Davis spent Labor Day weekend in jail. Okay, so on Tuesday after that, Bunning reversed course, and he said, okay, look it, since the other uh, deputy clerks have decided that they will comply with the court's order, we're going to drop the case against Kim Davis, and, and, and that's been the case so far. So, so far. Now, Davis lawyers, however, they've said she's not satisfied with this arrangement. She says that any marriage license that carries her name, right, even if she's not one of the clerks that that uh, gave it out actually um, violates her religious freedom because uh, she has to sign her name against her conscience on a same-sex marriage license. So this is ongoing. Now, uh, it, again, if you've been paying a, in the last week, uh, the the new governor of Kentucky has or who has just recently uh, won the election was actually saying, look. I support Kim Davis, and so a lot of people are saying the reason he was elected, Matt Bevan, I believe his name was, is because of the fact that he supported Kim Davis and her religious freedom over, well, not over, uh, you know, same-sex marriage, but saying, look it, they need to coexist, at least uh, he was giving that. Now, my guest tonight is an expert on all this kind of stuff, very knowledgeable, knows a lot more than I do. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to learning a lot. Uh, if you're listening out there, you're going to learn a lot, and I'm going to learn a lot. His name is Dr. Gary Cass, and his, his website is defendchristians.org. A little bit of his background, he began in ministry preaching the gospel behind the Iron Curtain, working with the persecuted church in the Soviet Union. He was given the Salt and Light Award by Dr. D. James Kennedy, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy, for his leadership in the San Diego area. In 2004, Dr. Cass became the executive director of the Center for Reclaiming America for Christ. That was an outreach of Coral Ridge Ministries, founded by D. James Kennedy. And he's also the author of several books, including uh, Gag Order and a variety of others, uh, talking about how Christians are being silenced, whether that's 
uh, through fear or intimidation or, or the law. He's also been on national TV, including ABC, CNN, Fox News, uh, and he's written in, in many publications like the Washington Post. He's heard daily on over 300 Christian radio stations across the nation on Freedom Alert, which basically is being on the cutting edge of uh, discrimination or persecution that's happening with Christians. And not too long ago, uh, Dr. Cass, you were actually over in um, you were over in Iraq mm-hmm. or, or uh, discussing the the plight of what's the the persecution that's going over on in Iraq. Thanks a lot for being on the show tonight. Oh, great! I'm, I'm looking forward to it, Kevin. Absolutely. So, uh, Dr. Cass, you you are a founder of what's called the Christian Anti Defamation Commission. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why you decided, mm-hmm. you know, along your history here to to start this up? I'll try to be brief. When I was working with Dr. Kennedy, we uh, identified what we thought was a gaping hole in the Christian uh, community. Uh, for decades, almost 100 years at that point, um, there was an organization called the Jewish Anti-Defamation League that, that was uh, originated in 1914. And their sole job was to fight against defamation of Jews, and uh, probably very appropriate at that time. But now what has happened in 100 years, uh, now Christians are essentially the only group in the country where you can be overtly and um, caustically uh, bigoted towards. Not only will you not be punished, you will actually be rewarded. You can get a cable television show if you'll actually do it every night on TV. And so we thought it was important that we uh, create a response. And uh, at some point, maybe we can go down that road to talk about why allowing defamation to go unchecked will become the the beginning of the slippery slope. And right now, <clears throat> excuse me, right, <clears throat> excuse me. Right now, we can see the. <clears throat> I'll get it. There we go. <laughs> no problem. Right there, we can see the um, the the fruit of allowing defamation to go unchecked has now ended up in some of the things I'm sure you're going to talk about on your program is the overt persecution and discrimination against Christians. And and defamation as opposed to persecution, the definition for you, for, for those listening, the action of damaging the good reputation of someone, slander or libel. Right. And, and that's the first step. Yeah. Because let me just give you the logical sure, progression. Sure, So, you, Kevin, if I can defame you, that is, I can define you and label you, if you will. And what is the typical labels thrown against people like us who actually love Christ and his word? Well, we're ignorant, we're Bible thumpers, we're bigots, there's a lot of things. So, And that's kind of the stereotype, that we're just uh, uninformed and and silly people. Yeah. Uh, But not silly, actually evil. Because of our religious fundamentalism, we are the moral equivalent of ISIS. Mm. And so they defame us as religious fundamentalists. Now, if I think about somebody in those terms, defamation leads to what? marginalization. I don't have to think of you as well. I can kind of minimize your arguments. I can minimize your person. I, you're just a second class citizen, if you will. You're one of those kinds of Christians. So defamation leads to marginalization, which leads ultimately to discrimination. Because you are that person, because I don't have to think of you as a, an equal, I can treat you differently. Yeah. I can begin to uh, discriminate against you. And when discrimination goes unchecked, it goes to persecution. And when persecution goes unchecked, it actually leads to genocide. Now, where would I get that from? The Jewish Anti-Defamation League. That's exactly what Hitler did to the Jews in Nazi Germany. You defame them, they, they are the problem. Then because they're the problem, we marginalize them because, we are, because they're the problem. The solution is to persecute and discriminate against them and ultimately get rid of them. So that's the slippery slope that begins with defamation, and that's why we've started this organization. We cannot allow our enemies to define us in a way that is untrue. That makes so much sense. I mean, I I just, everything you're saying there, um, I've experienced that in my own life. I mean, I I had somebody, when I was in college, uh, I told them I was a Christian, and immediately uh, the words coming out of their mouth were, oh, you must be this, you must be this, you must be this, you must be this. And, you know, none of the way they characterized me is what, what I was. And so, but it had been built up over time in their mind 
through what you're talking about, defamation mm-hmm. of character. So, you know, um, we are going to have a, a great conversation. What do we do about these issues? Uh, how do we handle the situation? And that's what they did to Kim Davis. Yes, exactly. We're going to be right back. My guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass, and uh, we're talking about defamation, discrimination, and persecution of Christianity in America. We'll be right back. What do leading local restaurants have in common? They depend on Express Fix Coffee for new and used coffee and espresso machines, repairs, and affordable monthly service. Dave Martin and his local team provide water filtration services too. Call San Diego's best espresso repair company, serving your home and business. Learn more online at expressfixcoffee.com. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. 619-867-3853. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It's our honor and privilege to support Kevin and his show. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teachings. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. Add historic American beauty to your home today with genuine Amish furniture. It's built in the USA from solid cherry wood with a bourbon finish. Or choose alternative woods and finishes to accent your home's decor. You'll find it all at Tucker's Valley Furniture. For over 65 years, the Tucker family has served San Diego County. Still family owned. Cash and Carry and Tucker's Valley Furniture. Two stores, both right across the street at Main and Mollison in El Cajon. Learn more at Tucker'sValleyFurniture.com. Thanks for listening today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover, and we're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. You can stream the show all over the world at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org, where you can listen to a recording of this show and previous shows. You can check it out also on our YouTube channel, uh, on the podcast, on iTunes. And so uh, all kinds of uh, access if you want to review things that we're talking about tonight. We're talking about uh, defamation. That is, uh, you know, libel or slander, st- uh, causing somebody to be stereotyped, putting them down. And we were talking about Kim Davis and how uh, she was essentially I- experienced this and then ultimately was put in prison. It's, it's incredible that here in America, uh, in the attempt to exercise her freedom of religion, she ends up in prison. Uh just blows my mind. I would never thought this was possible 20 years ago. Well, let's, but you know, this is a great uh, topic because, and let's, uh, and there's a couple of assumptions as, as scandalized as I am that uh, somebody uh, like Kim would end up in jail. But there's another uh, misnomer. There is not an absolute freedom of religion in the United States. Never has been, never will be. There is no such thing as an absolute free uh, right to freedom of religion. Oh, you, now you're you're really uh, there's a people out there listening right now going, "What? I've yeah. never heard this before." <laughs> okay, no, and and I understand why because we do. Uh, there is there is freedom of religion, but here, do we believe? In fact, I can I can give you the name of somebody else who's in prison right now for practicing his religion. It's the guy Jeffries from uh, Utah, who and I think or Arizona, where according to his religion. He could marry girls as young as 12, 13, 14 years old, and he was trying to practice his religion. And guess where he is right now? He's mm. in a jail. Uh, why? Because there's limits on religion. Um, there are people who are trying to practice jihad uh, right now, attempted to murder people, and have been arrested for doing what? Practicing their religion. So we have to be careful to uh, not get sucked into uh, uh, an argument that says there's an absolute right to the freedom of religion in the United States. There never has been. And by the way, there never can be. Now, this kind of brings up something that came to my mind, just thinking about what you're saying here. 
you know, not too long ago, I believe it was in Chicago, they recently put up a uh, satanic statue. Mm-hmm. Are you, you know about this? Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, in Florida, a group wanted to pass out satanic children's uh, coloring books to the school. They said, look, if you can pass out Bibles in the school, you can. we can pass out satanic coloring books. Okay. And uh, What's wrong with that, right? Yeah, exactly. What's wrong with that? Somebody's going to say, who are you to think that your, your viewpoint okay. is? And, the, and this, again, um, because we haven't thought it through very clearly, and we've been essentially um, emasculated by secular slogans. Oh, there's a separation of church and state. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, we're supposed to crawl into the fetal position and, and never do anything because there's this uh, separation of church and state. Um, there's just so many assumptions that we've been fed, especially our generation, the baby boomers and the ones uh, coming after that, of this radical secular fundamentalism that's been imposed upon the country. Uh, but it hasn't always been this way uh, in our country. So um, there are always limits on religion. But then, Kevin, that begs a question. Who gets decide? Who gets to decide the limits? Yeah, exactly. Because there's going to be limits somewhere. And for whatever reason, uh, the Christians have surrendered the culture to say, we're going to let the secularists draw the line about where the limits are. Well, let me ask you a question. What are, where do the secularists get their moral authority? Mm. To what authority can a secularist appeal to in order to say this is right and this is wrong, other than just pure subjective Opinion. Yeah. It's, it's just kind, their it's, guessing. It's kind of a, a pin, might makes right, really. It's whoever's in charge gets to make the rules. Yeah, so it comes down ultimately to force. Yeah. Uh, we're right because we can back it up with the force of government. That's not what this country was built, built upon. In fact, all countries in the history of mankind have been founded on religion. Mm. Because religion is what? Religion is the place where we hold our most deepest uh, convictions about what's right and what's wrong, what's moral, what's immoral. And all civil government is, is our religion applied to our our civil relationships. So that's why we're in moral schizophrenia right now. This country was not built upon that. Remember in our founding document, the, the Declaration of Independence, the appeal that the founders made in order to even become independent was the proper appeal to what? The laws of nature and of nature's God. Now, is this what you would call Christian common law? Is this where you? This is our Christian common law that we had. That was uh, just ninety-seven percent of the people. Actually, it's higher than that, but at least ninety-seven percent of the founding era uh, people would have identified as Christian. Most of them as Calvinist Christians that were steeped in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Westminster Catechism which lays out where moral, uh, where civil government gets its morality and all of that. And that was the common law that was in place when we ratified the Constitution, and that was our organic law for hundreds of years. And so what we're experiencing right now, if you will, this, this foreign body has, if you, want to, if you will, a cancer, is attacking the body politic, and now the body politic doesn't know how to react, and there's this... this cognitive dissonance between these ideas of secularism that have been largely uh, accepted by baby boomers and the millennials because it was pounded into our head that was absolutely would be absolutely foreign to our founders, at least the way that we understand yeah. today. Would you say that there is a growing body of people that are coming to grips with uh, the, what's happened in our country since you know 1962, 63 and earlier uh, that are becoming, hey, we need to articulate kind of what you're explaining here Mm -hmm. and becoming more aware of the consequences of embracing secularism. Well, you know, this isn't, we're not the first ones to see this. Of course, uh, I worked for Dr. Kennedy. He was one of the founding members of the moral majority. They saw this. They saw this decades ago. Uh, I can give you sources all the way back to the early 1920s. Uh, Gretchen Machen, the founder of Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, uh, wrote a whole book on this whole issue of modernism in other words, the abandonment of the word of God is our moral standard. And where this would lead to it, it leads to this moral chaos and effectively humanistic t- uh, tyranny that we're experiencing right now that comes from these unconstitutional edicts from the Supreme Court. Now, you know, I, I was up at the Mount Soledad Cross uh, uh, quite a few years back, 
uh, and I got into a discussion with somebody who was there protest protesting the cross. Uh, she was involved with the uh, San Diego uh, Coalition of Reason, and I got into this discussion, and she said, I said, it was founded on Christian principles, and she said, yeah, but we don't want to go back to that. Why would we want to go back to that? And then, you know, she accused them of, uh, they were slaveholders, Why? and they were this and that. Yeah. Okay. I, I grant slavery. Yeah. Okay. That's unexcusable. It was anti-Christian. Mm. The founders even knew that. Yeah. They knew that it would have to be dealt with at some point. And frankly, I believe we atoned for the sin of slavery with 600,000 dead people. Mm. That was the cost of the Civil War. Yeah. I believe that that was God meeting out his discipline upon us for it. And, uh, but regardless, um, we don't want to go back to that. Well, what is the fruit of the American Revolution. Well, history stands there to say we've given more liberty, more prosperity, more blessing, and we've done more to advance the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ than any other nation in the history of the world. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with that. Now, if you're a secularist, that's that's horrific. Yeah. Uh, because they want us to have godless atheism. But then we say, well, what would godless atheism give us? Oh, we don't have to go very far. Let's just read the history of the last century mm -hmm. where the atheistic godless uh, folk have been given the reins of power and they murdered over 100 million people. And that's documented in the, in the Black Book of Communism written by a secular source. Yeah. So, And we're talking about Lenin. You're talking about Lenin, Pol Stalin, Pot. Pol Pot, yeah. all of the so-called utopian ideas of bringing atheistic uh, communism uh, to bear. And what is the fruit of it? More tyranny, misogyny, violence, murder. And so, the reality is is that if you are if if you know if you're an atheist, you don't you can't appeal to any higher power. It's just really whoever's in charge gets to make the rules and you just hope uh to whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And the founders to, rejected that. Yeah, and they rejected that. that. And that's what was happening in England. They said they had the power and we said no, your power, your just powers only come to you from God. You have broken your covenant with God. You're acting as a tyrant. Therefore, your government is no longer valid. Very good. Okay. My, my guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass, and uh, I think this is just such a needed discussion. We're going to be right back, and we're going to continue to talk about Christian common law, and does that apply to us today, despite the Supreme Court cases that have taken place? Uh, do they override what uh, was set up by the founders? We'll be right back. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart. Not all home inspections are created equal. Joe DeMars and his team at Housemaster have performed inspections in San Diego for 22 years plus and performed over 10,000 inspections for commercial, multiple family, apartments, and residential. Call before you buy or sell. You'll have confidence knowing the true condition of the property. Call 619-660-7866, sandiego.housemaster.com. Home inspections, done right, guaranteed. 619-660-7866. How can you live in San Diego and miss out on enjoying the water? Fast Lane Kayaking sells popular Hobie Cat kayaks that you pedal, not paddle. That means your hands are left free for fishing and fun. Just throw these on your roof rack. They're light and they're easy to use and maintain. Just rinse them off. Try one free on a demo ride. For 36 years, Ron and Debbie Lane have served San Diego with fun, family-friendly water sports of all kinds. Learn more. FastLaneSailing.com. 619-222-0766. No more hiding, no more I hear you calling me, and I'm coming. Thanks for tuning in to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego, every Sunday, 4 to 5 p.m. My website's educateforlife.org, and you can, take, you can take classes on my website that actually have to do with these issues. Where did separation of church and state come from? Uh, how am I supposed to live as a Christian? Is it legal for a cross to be on federal property like the Mount Soledad Cross here in San Diego? All kinds of questions that we address and answer. My guest tonight is an expert on this, Dr. Gary Cass. His website is defendchristians.org, and really what he's trying to do is stop the culture from uh, defaming uh, from from putting down, from slandering the character of Christians, and uh, Gary, we started off with talking about Kim Davis and how uh, what she went through and what she's still going through, really. Mm -hmm. And so, my question to you would it would be, what happened right there? What happened wrong there? In the future, as Christians, uh, what are we to pursue uh, 
in this in this kind of a situation. Okay. I can give you and the who I I'm conflicted here because in so many ways I respect Kim Davis, mm-hmm. but she is just I'm I don't I don't mean it to be I don't want to minimize her, but it's bigger than her. Mm. This issue, she is more or less a, an icon, an image of a, a symptom, problem. Yeah, yeah, a much greater problem yeah. that we're struggling with and that we have to come to grips with. So I don't want to minimize what she's done, but I'm not happy with the way things went. And let me get back to kind of the conflict that we're talking about. Yeah. So we have this Christian common law that we were founded on. Nobody ever thought we'd have to define marriage. But by the way, we saw what was going on with the secularization of our culture. Yeah. And Kentucky said, just in case. Gary, I want to I want to stop you for one second. I think a lot of our listeners are going to be confused about the term Christian common law. Okay. When when you say that, and and just for clarification, right. what you're saying is laws based off of Christianity right. and the that, Bible. That we all had in common that was not up for grabs. It was our culture. It was the common law. We knew right from wrong. We knew nobody argued about. Yeah, it was. A, it was our assumption whether, whether the Bible was true or not. It was the axiom. It was their premise. Yeah, we just lived as if the Bible were true, and that what that God made a man and a woman to be married to each other. We didn't need to that adultery was wrong. That yeah, all of was this. Wrong, that law oh, was wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. it was just uh, taken for granted that that. Yeah, was the case. we didn't. That was not up for debate. We were a Christian country, and that we had this Christian heritage, which is rooted in Scripture. Yeah. And so that was that's the ethos out of which this whole country was founded. Mm. Now, in the last few decades, secularism has t- you know taken hold like a vengeance, largely through the courts. Mm-hmm. And so we saw this happening. We saw the legalization of same-sex relationships, et cetera. And so Kentucky said, well, I know what we're going to do. We're going to do what a lot of other states have done. We're going to pass a constitutional amendment defining marriage for our state. And that passed. That marriage was between one man and one woman. Over 75% of the people of Kentucky passed that marriage amendment, not unlike the other amendments that were passed all over the country. Yeah, California was 70% okay. too. And so here's, uh, understand Kim Davis. She is a an elected official, a county clerk in the state of Kentucky, and therefore subject to Kentucky law. During the summer, the Supreme Court then with the Obelfeld uh, decision basically said that that plaintiff had the right to be married. Okay, interesting. Where did they get that right? And if you read read the dissenting uh, uh, justices, they would say the the majority is just making stuff up. Yeah, they, out, they, out of thin air. It, there's no, it's just an act of power. It's not an act of law. So these five, I would say, tyrannical Supreme Court justices just declared it so not based upon the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that gave them either the authority or the the right to be able to even speak to the issue, much mm-hmm. less tell the states what they should do. So here's Kim Davis, and now you have homosexual activists who are stirring things up, and she's a holdout saying, I'm not going to, you know, there's a conflict here between state law and federal law. And so she thought she could come up with kind of a halfway position This is what I'm not happy with. She wanted to have religious accommodation. What do you mean? She wanted to say, okay, we will recognize the authority of the Supreme Court and their decision, but I just want as a, if you will, conscientious objector to be able to continue in my role as a county clerk and be exempted from having to issue these same-sex licenses. She wanted another county to do it. Or or even her deputy she would allow to do it. But at at the end of the day, I think she gave up too much. Because what did Kim Davis do that was wrong? Nothing. She was an elected official, duly appointed in a state that defined marriage biblically according to their Christian common law, according to hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of, of civilization, hundreds of years of our common law, heritage she did nothing wrong so what would somebody she was other- essentially saying the supreme court is right and they have authority so in in my best scene scenario yeah she should have said i don't recognize the authority of the supreme court to tell me to issue a same-sex marriage license now, now that would have precipitated a crisis mm. but it's the right kind of crisis that's what the lesser the lower magistrate is supposed to do when a higher magistrate becomes tyrannical it's incumbent upon our lower magistrates, people like K. 
county clerks, county sheriffs, state governors, state legislators to tell the federal government, you've overstepped your bounds. The state gave the federal government limited jurisdiction. They do not have jurisdiction over marriage, and we, do not rec- we don't recognize federal authority over marriage. So would this have precipitated a, a, some sort of a showdown between the federal mm-hmm. government and the state? It's a Tenth Amendment issue where we would say the Tenth Amendment says that only those powers which have been delegated to the federal government are theirs. Everything else is left to the state and the people. Mm-hmm. And the people have spoken. The state has spoken. Marriage is a man and a woman. No federal jurisdiction can come in and undermine the will of the people. And by the way, it's in accordance with God's law, the laws of nature, our common law. It's the Supreme Court that's illegal, not Kim Davis. That has to be the issue. But we've all been drinking what I call the Kool-Aid of judicial supremacy Mm -hmm. for so long that whenever the Supreme Court speaks, we're supposed to, like little slaves, bow down and worship their opinions instead of saying, no, your opinion is in violation of the Constitution, you're in violation of the Declaration, you're in violation of the laws of nature and nature's God. Is this because the Supreme Court, you know, once they make that decision, it's hard to organize enough people to get on board with this, to be knowledgeable of what you're talking about, and then to kind of create a groundswell movement that That's because we, the people, have become lazy. Become, we don't realize educated and, we're not educated yeah. and we don't realize. And there's a, a great, glorious history of this in our own history that we should bring up that, uh, by the way, and this is why I think Kentucky is kind of a, a poetic opportunity that God has given us. Mm. This, uh, this idea of the states, if you will, the lesser magistrates, interposing, that is coming between the federal government and their people. This is what's been called the doctrine of interposition. Okay. Now, before you get onto that real quick, I just want to clarify something. You said the doctrine of lesser magistrate. Now, is that something that is, where, where does that originate from that doctrine? That goes all the way back to John Calvin and the, his institutes chapter 20 of Calvin's institutes of the 1500s. And this is something that the founding fathers embraced as this was part of our common understanding that there are limits on government. Okay. There's limits on the King that our whole declaration of independence was predicated upon one simple assumption. God limits all authority. And when Kings and parliaments become tyrannical, It is the duty of the people and those who represent them to throw off the government. That's if read the Declaration of Independence. It's a complete doctrine of the lesser magistrate where our elected officials, the Continental Congress, said to King George after a long train of abuses, we're done. Mm -hmm. You've nullified your legitimate authority. My, my guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass, and we're learning a ton here. Uh, I think it's such an important subject. We're going to be right back. We've got a few more segments left, and uh, stay with us. When you need tires or service, count on Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service in Oceanside for a full range of affordable options in all the brands you trust. See their great customer reviews and special offers online. Hours Tuesday through Friday, 7.30 to 5.30, and Saturdays, 7.30 to 5. Call Dan and his team at 760-439-1631. Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service, 2405 Oceanside Boulevard in Oceanside, 760-439-1631. Do you have one-button espresso machines in your home or business? They make delicious coffee drinks, but they're not maintenance-free. Express Fix Coffee is San Diego's source for coffee and espresso machine repair, sales, and service. Call Dave Martin at Express Fix Coffee for new and used espresso machines, repairs, parts, and accessories. They'll save you time and money. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. Learn more at ExpressFixCoffee.com. Then go and- Back and forth from doing right to doing wrong. Cause we were taught that's who we are. Come on, get Welcome back to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. Uh, my guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass, and his website is defendchristians.org. And uh, he is uh, a founder of what's called the Christian Anti Defamation Commission. And the goal of this is to stop defamation of Christians, um, both domestically, internationally. Uh, He wants to stop this because defamation is where it starts. Then it gets to discrimination and ultimately it gets to persecution. So Gary, we were talking about Kim Davis. You're talking Mm -hmm. about uh, the doctrine of um, 
lesser lesser magistrate, which is basically the idea, if I understood you right, the idea that somebody who is under the authority of somebody else, if that person that is over them defies their authority, which is God, then that that do, that that lesser uh, person has mm -hmm. to obey God rather than man, is what you're saying. Yeah, let me give you a couple of historical examples, just really quick. Okay. Many of you in your audience are probably familiar with the military, if not been in the military. What would happen if your commanding officer gave you what is defined in the uh, military code of justice as an unlawful order? If you obey that order, what happens to you? Are you innocent? You can say, well, I'm just following orders. My commanding officer told me I had to do it. And we would say, absolutely not. And that's the, that's you the have to defy an unlawful order. That's, by the, uh, the, that's Nazism. Nazism was the trials. The, the, Nuremberg, the Nuremberg trials. The Nuremberg trials were, were pro, the Nazis who said all they were doing was obeying orders, were tried, convicted, and hung because they didn't defy those orders. Why? Because there was a transcendent law called the Ten Commandments yeah. that was written on their heart, and they knew they were obligated to obey it. So interna powerful. international yeah. law is predicated upon the laws of nature and nature's God written on the heart. Uh, but in America, uh, nullification, this defiance of tyrannical authority, um, is happening. Now, sometimes it's used illicitly. For example, uh, sanctuary cities right now all across the United States are defying federal law saying we're not going to enforce it and we're not going to recognize uh, federal immigration law. I would argue those federal immigration laws are absolutely legitimate laws. And that's one of the few things that the federal government is supposed to be doing, yeah. which is securing our borders. But they're nullifying it by defying it. What about the uh, medical marijuana and uh, even in Colorado, the recreational use of marijuana, that's an open defiance of the federal government. Yeah, which, I don't says, hear, which says that marijuana is illegal. Yep. Yeah, it's still on the books. Even medical marijuana is illegal. Now, what? so what's interesting here is what are the those who are so advocating recreational use of marijuana in Colorado? Uh, what would you say is the problem there? Because they're appealing to a a supreme authority that is different than than what the, the the supreme authority you're appealing to we would say well they're wrong they're appealing to themselves and they're appealing to yeah as some pagan uh, non-christian view of god and it's certainly not part of our common law and so they're making up stuff too and i don't think any state or any federal government or any person any husband any pastor any elected official has absolute authority to do anything they want we're all subject to god that's what keeps this from becoming tyrannical. God has set the boundaries. He's revealed it in his word. He's, he's written his law in our heart. That's what this country was founded upon. Mm. And so in taking this now back to the, the issue at hand with Kim Davis, um, Kim Davis is doing exactly what she should have done. She's the lesser magistrate. She's a county clerk. But the, the Supreme Court has become a tyrant. Unfortunately, the then Democrat governor of Kentucky would not intervene to uh, help Kim Davis, who, by the way, is a Democrat, um, and left her out to dry because for whatever reason, he didn't he, he may agree with same sex yeah, marriage. Yeah. And so what we're hoping will happen is the new governor, who is a conservative Republican, mm -hmm. will do his job and interpose between the state and the federal government. And that's and the doctor of, doctrine that'd of be interposition. Interposition. And why would that be so poetic? Because most of us have forgotten our history. Most of us don't remember the 1798 re uh, uh, Kentucky resolutions. In 1798, the U.S. Congress uh, passed a law called the Alien and Sedition Acts, signed into law by then-President John Adams, saying it was unconstitutional or illegal for you to criticize the president or the Congress. Wow. In, in clear violation of the First Amendment, John the Bill Adams. of Rights. John Adams signed it into law. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and so uh, then Vice President Thomas Jefferson said, well, this is a problem. Um, and he actually went to Virginia. He couldn't get it done in Virginia. Virginia, uh, the, the Virginia resolutions came after the Kentucky resolutions, but it was Kentucky that told the federal government in 1798, if you dare come into our state and try to enforce this, this law, we're actually going to imprison you and, and, and convict you because you don't have any constitutional jurisdiction to come in and do that. Wow. Kentucky, I, I encourage your listeners to look up the Kentucky Resolution 1798 written by Thomas Jefferson. The second uh, most 
well-known example of this historically is the Fugitive Slave Act. Remember, the, the Congress uh, passed a law, and it was signed into law, that any slaves from the southern slave states that fled into the north would have to, by law, be returned to the southern mm-hmm. states. Well, many of the northern states said, no, we're not doing that. We're not yet. doing that. We don't recognize the, the, the ruling of the, of, or that law assumes that you can lawfully look at people as property. We don't do that in our state. So they're not pr- anybody's property. They're a free uh, citizen of our state, and we're not returning them to you. Wisconsin uh, uh, famously was uh, not returning fugitive slaves. So uh, t- uh, a- uh, Abraham Lincoln when he was elected president, said, I do not recognize the authority of Dred Scott because the Dred Scott decision by the U.S. Supreme Court defined people as property. I do not believe that you can do that. Therefore, I do not recognize the authority of the Supreme Court and the Dred Scott decision. Wow. So we have a history of doing this, and it's been there. And this isn't anarchy. This isn't me making up, well, I don't like that law. I don't like that law. No, it's the lesser magistrate. This is the difference between anarchy and this constitutional way to be able to protect our rights. So I can't just personally, arbitrarily say, I don't like that law. I'm going to violate it. I declare it unconstitutional. Newsom Newsom did that in, uh, you know, San Francisco with the uh, giving away prior, before the Mm -hmm. whole. Well, you have to have the authority of the people and you have to have constitutional authority to do it. That goes all the way back to the Bible. And when you say the authority of the people, are you referring specifically to the, the people of the state? The people of the state that give their authority, they d- lend their authority, and the people would have to ratify it. Uh, you can go all the way back to the Old Testament. I can give you example after example of the people interposing. Remember when Saul made this very bizarre uh, yeah. rash vow. If anybody eats honey on the day that we go to war, they're going to die. Well, his own son, Jonathan, ate honey. Yeah, and they said, hey, no, we're not going to We're going to kill him. him. Yeah. And well, the people Saul, said— Saul was going to kill him. Saul was going to yeah. kill him, and the people said, nah, no, that's not going to happen. Queen Athaliah usurped the throne and began, began to kill the royal family. Only Josiah escaped. And what happened? The Levites, the, the religious leaders— and the generals, the military leaders, joined together to dethrone and kill Queen Athaliah and establish Josiah on the rightful throne. And by the way, Josiah is the one that restored the law to Israel. That's interposition. Okay. It's a biblical thing. It's a constitutional now, thing. It's historical. Okay, so that's that's there's I've got a lot of questions going around in my head here, and I'm sure our listeners do too. My guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass. It's very, very important stuff that we're talking about here. And uh, these are we're in uh, times where our country is splitting apart, uh, where, you know, half of our country or at least a large portion of our country is embracing agnosticism, secularism, humanism. And it's a philosophy that goes in a completely different direction than the biblical uh, Christian philosophy that our country was founded upon. And so we have to learn how to understand the times and then properly apply God's law. How do we live in these times? We're going to be right back. We've got one more segment to go. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It's our honor and privilege to support Kevin and his show. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teaching. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. In 1947, Gordon Tucker began serving San Diego County families. Today, the family tradition continues with two stores, Tucker's Valley Furniture and Cash and Carry, both right across the street in El Cajon at Maine and Mollison. Whether you want today's modern, eco-friendly furniture or authentic Amish furniture from solid cherry wood built in America, let the Tucker family serve your family. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. A proud sponsor of Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. Welcome to 
to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. You can also stream the show at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org. That's educate for F-O-R, life.org. My guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass, and he his website is defendchristians.org. He's a founder of the Christian Anti-Defamation Commission uh, to stop the defamation of Christians all over the country and, as well as around the world. So, uh, Dr. Cass, when we left off, we were talking about uh, this idea, uh, the doctrine of uh, interposition, the doctrine of lesser magistrate, the doctrine of nullification, which has all been used throughout U.S. history. We're seeing it even used today. And really, when we look at the issue of Kim Davis, and it's, it's almost the state of Kentucky versus the Supreme Court here. So, so what needs to happen if something like Kim Davis situation is repeated or maybe even still in the situation with Kim Davis? Well, there's, there's good news in this front. Um, the year there, I have even right now draft legislation that's going to be presented to the, uh, Tennessee legislature. Um, a lot of the legislatures around the country, of course, are part-time and they're going to be sworn in and new governors installed and new officers installed in January, and they'll begin their, their uh, legislative deliberations. And many of them, that'll be the first time they're together as deliberative bodies uh, and can now respond to this tyrannical overreach of the federal government in marriage. And uh, I'm encouraged, at least a lot of state legislators are starting to realize, wait a minute, we're not just an appendage of the federal government. We're actually the, to be the check and the balance. And uh, it's just, we've been so conditioned with kind of this strong central federal mm -hmm. system yeah. that when we start saying, no, states actually created the federal government, therefore the federal government should be subject to the creator. The states are the creator. The, the, the federal government is the creature, right? Yeah, yeah. And yet through time and just, uh, I think, maybe intellectual laziness or maybe lack of courage. It's, it's just easy to give in to tyranny. Mm -hmm. It's, it just, as long as my ox isn't getting gored, then uh, I don't care. Living your life. Yeah. I just want to live the life. But now, you know, we're starting to see this, this cavalier attitude we've had towards a strong centralized government that is out of control. They were given very definitive 18 limited powers and marriage certainly isn't one of those areas. In fact, in a previous uh, Supreme Court decision just before this last one, they admitted that, that the power of marriage belongs, any any uh, legislation or regulation of marriage would not be within the purview of the federal government. They even admitted that in the previous state uh, Supreme Court decision, and then they reversed themselves. So why are they so arbitrary and schizophrenic it's because they've lost their christian mind mm. they have no transcendent and once you once you abandon that christian mind what happens is it's pretty much whatever your opinion it's, is yes, goes. it's and see it becomes and more that political change, that can change from day to day so the supreme court becomes a political body mm. it's not supposed to they're supposed to be umpires the rules have been set through the laws of nature nature's god and the constitution all they're supposed to do is call strikes and balls um, they're not to be writing legislation or imposing their will, and that's exactly what they've done. So now it's up to the states to do their job. So here's what I'm working on right now. There is a list of, of governors who ran uh, for governor as pro-life, pro-family conservatives. They actually have state legislators and legis uh, majorities that actually – have defined themselves as conservative, pro-life, pro-family legislatures. We are going to begin a campaign to appeal to these governors to start um, a, a snowball of nullification uh, in accordance with the Constitution and the will of the people of their state, especially these states who have passed marriage amendments, and just say we do not recognize uh, the Supreme Court ruling, they're out of bounds. They're the ones that are illegal. We're the ones that are submitting to the Constitution, and we will not uh, enforce or uh, allow same-sex marriage in our jurisdictions. They have every right to do that. Now, it's going to take some courage, but it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, now, is, there, is there a variety of organizations that are actually uh, you know, supporting your efforts. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this, and it, by the way, it's not just my organization. Mm -hmm. There's, and, and it's not just Christians, by yeah. the way, yeah. there's a very strong 10th amendment movement out there 
When you that, say it's not just Christians, that's interesting to me because it seems that this is really uh, fundamentally a Christian. It, it its origins are Christian, right? So but that doesn't mean they they understand that. This is what I call borrowed intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. They're borrowing the Tenth Amendment and the Constitution. All of this, I believe, is the mature fruit of of Christian jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. There is a strong libertarian movement that's very strong on the Tenth Amendment. Um, I would say libertarianism could never produce the Constitution that we have because they don't believe in a creator, and they certainly don't believe in the laws of nature and nature's God. And everybody knew in the founding era that is the law of God written on the heart, our conscience, and the law of God revealed in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's what that phrase means. And so the libertarians are more of let each person do it. Kind of live will. and let live. Yeah, live but let here's live, yeah. the problem with libertarianism. Yeah. Who gets to decide what the standards of live and let live are? It, yeah. That becomes it, as it, arbitrary it, or, or subjective or tyrannical, to yes. use another word, yeah. it, as any other humanist system. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, uh, this is uh, very, very important, I think. And so, um, so what you're really doing here is you're asking the states to step up and exercise the, the rights that they have. Right, that we have for a, almost a generation now or longer— forfeited except the liberals the liberals haven't forfeited yeah. they're doing it right now now do you think that the liberal media is going to congratulate us when we stand up for godliness no they're going to they're going to try to vilify and, and say this is illegal but you they have no this, yeah. clothes because they're the ones who lionize these sanctuary cities now i would say that they've got it completely wrong and and backwards uh, the federal government actually can regulate uh, immigration. That's the one of the few limited powers that they do have. Mm -hmm. And our laws uh, are largely very just and, frankly, quite liberal relative to the immigration laws of the rest of the world. But the state does have a right to do that, and we should be following them and enforcing them. So it's it. I think this is a wonderful moment. And, and a lot of people say, but this is going to lead to anarchy. Let me tell you what leads to anarchy, tyranny. Yeah. When tyranny gets to a certain point, the people are going to rebel. The founders were wise enough to give us a relief valve, a safety valve, and that is when the lower or lesser magistrates interpose or intervene on behalf of the people and nullify the tyranny of a strong centralized government. They yeah. saw this coming. They gave us the way to, to remedy it. Another remedy is I'd love to see is that some of our Christian conservative uh, liberty loving uh, members of Congress would start articles of impeachment against the Supreme Court members. Mm. We let these these judges make these unconstitutional rules and nothing happens. And and there's a lever for them to start articles of impeachment, even if they're not successful. Yeah. Just the shot over the bow to tell these judges, kind of we're watching check. you, yeah. we're keeping you in check, yeah. would be very healthy. My guest tonight is Dr. Gary Cass, and uh, you know we're discussing all the, the controversy over Kim Davis. It's not just that, the florists who are being sued and losing their business simply for not participating in homosexual weddings. Uh, recently, uh, the people who had the cake baking business uh, lost their business. Uh, there's stuff going on all over the country, which... Uh, is very sad, but we have to take this opportunity to step up and do what we need to do. Um, we're going to be back next week with Dr. Gary Cass. His website is defendchristians.org. And, uh, and we're going to continue this discussion because it's just that important, especially with the elections coming up and everything else. So have a fantastic night, Dr. Gary Cass. Thanks for being here on the show. Thanks, Kevin. Absolutely. And we'll be back next week. Have a great night. Educate for Life with Kevin Conover, a regular feature on AM 1170, The Answer. Learn more about Kevin and his work online at his website, educateforlife.com. That's educateforlife.com. You'll find great resources, ideas, and even video classes there to help you grow and understand what in the world is happening. Encourage your friends to listen for great guests and intelligent analysis of the stories that shape our lives. Educate for Life with Kevin Conover, exclusively on AM 1170. The answer. Bring your tide and bring your shame.